our speaker, New Tenix, is going to have a speaker for us. They haven't given us the name yet. Um, and then on June 13th, Kendra Little will be here telling us about how keys and included columns work. Uh, going through the rest of our past slide deck. Yeah, I see my screen. Oh, no. Hang on one second, everybody. All right, can you see my screen now? Oh, no. Sorry I can, but there you okay, go. Now go. I can see the data architecture <laughs> sponsor. Perfect. Okay, thank you. So, uh, sorry about that, everybody. Wait a minute, but now it just switched off again. What is going on here? Unless you meant to show the browser. Sorry. Oh, no. There we go. Well, I can see the website. But not the slides. <laughs> oh, no. Where did the slides go, Kenny? <laughs> Maybe Sorry, it's, everybody. do you have multiple screens? There we go, that's the slides. Do you have multiple screens? I, is that the slides? That's the slides. Okay, so I'm just gonna do this. Sorry about this, everybody. So we are sponsored by Nutanix, uh, thanks to them. And now I can't, I can't change slides. So I'm gonna just skip to the end and say, <laughs> take it away, Kim. <laughs> well, Okay. Sorry about that, well, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Let me let me share my screen and hopefully um, I got it. Hopefully it'll let me choose which screen to show you guys. Perfect. And it's not the slides right now. Hold on. Let me just switch over. Okay. So I will try and watch the chat window here. Let me pop it up so that it's a little bit bigger. Um, so if you do have questions during the session, I will try to watch the chat window and see if there's anything I can address while I'm lecturing. And if not, I'm happy to stick around at the end. I do want to try to keep this to about an hour so that, you know, for those of you that only schedule an hour, you can be done with the, the, the content of the session. But like I said, I'll stick around for questions at the end. Um, so I'm going to watch the chat window, so if there's anybody that can't see it, I can also see that you can't see it. But I think everybody can. Kenny, can you see everything? Are you good? It looks good to me. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, I have a few obligatory marketing slides. I'll blast through these really quickly just so that I get to the content. Most of you know our team, SQL Skills, and we have just a, a fantastic team. I, I'm I'm so proud of our team, such great folks and, and so much passion and focus in SQL Server. So if you don't know us, check us out on Twitter, check out our blogs. We do instructor-led training, we do online training. We just actually started uh, classes that are online but live as well. I don't even have that on here. In fact, I'm doing one on very large tables um, next week, in fact. Um, so anyway, you can see a lot of that stuff on our website, sqlskills.com, consulting, remote DBA, conferences, all sorts of stuff. Probably one of the cool things, if you don't know about it, at the very bottom of this slide is our insider program. If you're interested in getting two emails a month, and I promise we don't spam you or sell your emails or anything like that, but we do two emails a month that have some technical tidbits on them and some interesting information problems we've been seeing, and it's really interesting, and, and it, this newsletter's actually gotten up to something like seven, eight, nine, ten, sometimes eleven pages long, with just tons of new content. So it's quite fun and it's free and and so forth. So join our insider program. Um, like I said, we do online training, we do virtual training. Um, we now are doing these live immersion events. Uh, we always announce them in our newsletter first, like the IEVLT course that I'm doing. So anyway, all of that stuff is on SQL Skills training and you can read that online. We've got some just great fun uh, classes in some locations around the US and uh, also in London this year. So maybe we'll see you in person as well. And in less than two weeks, actually it's next, 
next weekend, basically, our uh, conference that Paul and I manage, uh, SQL Intersection, is coming up. So if any of you are interested, we have a ton of workshops, uh, great speakers. We have an evening event called SQL After Dark that's great fun. So anyway, I'll just put that in, and you guys can certainly look at that in the slides. And then the last marketing slide is Plural Site. And this one is actually, I think, even better than just marketing. I mean, yes, we do have courses on Plural Site, and you can sign up, I think, for personally a very reasonable amount to get access to thousands and thousands and thousands of courses. I mean, it's it's really amazing how much content is there. But what's really cool is if you want, you can send email to Paul. He manages our codes and you can get a free, no catches, no credit card kind of thing. Uh, and get 30 days access to just our SQL skills content, but there's over 160 hours of content there just from SQL skills. So we've got a, a full library of training there and it's really cool. And all you have to do is send email to Paul to, to give it a shot and try it out. And, and you don't have to enter a credit card. It's not like they'll start billing you after the 30 days. It's literally, you can try it out and then if you want, you can sign up, um, but no catches. Um, my name is Kimberly Tripp, and as Kenny mentioned, I've been doing this for a long time. I really love it. I, I really love architecture almost more than anything else. So architecting very large tables and high availability databases. But what's really interesting is there's a lot of secondary problems that people see, even if they do a good architecture, even if they do proper indexing, they might start having problems with things like stored procedures, where those stored procedures aren't using the indexes that they thought they set up for that code to use. And so the area that I tend to focus on the most is exactly as I just mentioned, architecture, indexing, performance, statistics, and procedures. And so those are the topics you'll see me presenting on most at various events and conferences and so forth. And, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And it's one of my favorites because I'm going to be doing a lot of demos as well. So let me dive right in. I'm going to start with a little bit on processing stored procedures, talk about optimization of stored procedures and how plans for procedures are created, as well as when they become invalidated. And I'll explain more on what I mean by that. A lot of people look at stored procedures as positive because they're cached. So I want to talk about the benefits of caching, but the problems that occur when a procedure is cached and the quality of its plan is not really good for a lot of different parameters that are being passed in. So I'll talk about the concepts behind recompilation and when it's a good idea to recompile. But sometimes people get a little bit crazy with this recompilation option, and there is a problem with over-recompilation. So you have to be really careful not to just go crazy and put something I'm going to show you in the in today's lecture, you know, to overuse it. You don't want to just put it everywhere. So I have at the end of the session a, an intro to an approach that is more complicated, but it's way more powerful and way more beneficial if it's used appropriately, um, you know, this recompilation tactic. And I call it the hybrid approach. So I'll show you this, and I am going to give you a whole bunch more resources that you can spend some more time on if this is something that seems appropriate and interesting to you. And I, I hope that's the case because I have had so many just huge wins with these strategies. In fact, one of the reasons that I love this session the most is that I have never been to a customer and not seen this. Now, sorry for the double negative, but my point is I see this everywhere. The problems I'm going to show you today are everywhere. In fact, I just got an email from somebody in the community, actually, just a, a couple of days ago, and they said, you know, oh, when I do this, my procedure does this, but when I do this, my procedure does this. And, and then they explain the whole thing, and I'm like, that is the pure definition of these plan quality problems and parameter sensitivity. So I'm going to explain that and explain how it happens and give you some great solutions for solving it, and mostly with demos. And everything I do today, just to stress, Everything I do today, I'm going to bundle up into a zip, pass this off to Kenny, and when the video is available and you can watch this online, you'll also have access to all my demo scripts, the, the PDF and so forth of the slides and all the content so that you can go back through this and reproduce everything I'm showing you. So 
this will be something you can really, you know, dive into and get some good insight into. So in terms of processing, when you, and, and I apologize, I'm going to be sipping tea quite often here. I have a little bit of a cold from uh, travels. I just came back from a, a trip and the travels were quite extensive. I spent basically two days in transit and the times of the flights were terrible too. Like one flight left at 1230 AM, you know, so you, after 10 hours basically waiting at the airport so uh, a few of us have gotten a little sick so anyway I'm, I'm sucking down tea here so hold on a second yes in fact this session is brought to you by throat coat <laughs> so <coughs> excuse me so processing stored procedures when you guys create a stored procedure not really all that much happens. SQL Server checks the syntax, and they do resolution if resolution is possible. There's some limitations to resolution. And what resolution is really doing is trying to resolve all of the names of the objects and the columns you've specified in the code to make sure that they're correct and that they exist. But of course, if you reference temporary objects and those objects don't exist at the time that you create that procedure, then they can't resolve those objects and so in fact what they do instead is something called delayed name resolution so they will resolve at runtime but really at creation that's all that happens and I, I don't want to you know dwell on this but they don't optimize the code they don't store a plan with the code they literally just take the code of that procedure and store it as rows into internal tables and you can access that metadata as many of you know through a lot of the metadata catalog views and metadata catalog procedures and functions and so forth but there's really nothing that tracks like the procedure or its plans at this point when it's just been created now what starts to get interesting is when you first execute or let me rephrase this if you execute and there isn't already a plan that's available in the cache now I'm 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 ugh, I'm kind of not being really specific about what I mean here because I can open up a huge can of worms and talk about a variety of things that influence um, and impact, I should say, execution. And that has to do with session settings. Because if you've got two clients connected to SQL Server and they have different session settings, session settings can impact execution. So it turns out that if one session has certain session settings and there's a plan created for that session, and another session executes that same procedure but has different session settings, then SQL Server doesn't deem that first execution's plan as valid for this second execution. So that's what I mean by if you execute and there isn't already a plan that's available in the cache that's appropriate for you. So I kind of, you know, simplified it on the slide and I'm kind of complicating things but I just wanted to stress one aspect that stored procedures can have multiple and even potentially different plans in the cache that are getting used by different users of different applications with different session settings so that can further complicate um, troubleshooting and I did do an entire course on this on Pluralsight um, so, you know, that's my little tangent here, and that course is my second stored procedure course. So I've got two, and believe me, I only have five courses on Pluralsight. You won't have a problem finding my courses if you just search by trip, and I've got an optimizing stored procedures course, which is about seven hours long, and then I've got a part two to that, which talks about the external influences on plans and caching, like session settings and things like that. So I know this is a little bit of tangent, but if some of you have ever had some really weird troubleshooting problems, I bet it's session settings and that second course might really help you out. So bringing it all back together, when you execute and there isn't a plan in the cache, then at that time, a plan will be created for your execution and your parameters. That plan is then put into the cache and it can be reused 
for subsequent users as long as they meet the same execution criteria, like the session settings and there's other things like the resource governor group. So there's, there's other things that basically say whether or not that plan is appropriate to be reused. But here's the point. The only thing that they really care about is does your session setting and your external factors basically match? They aren't looking for, like, do your procedure parameters match? And that compiled plan, there is a benefit that it's compiled and it's in the cache and, you know, it's available to you, so that sounds positive. But sometimes that plan isn't really appropriate for your parameters. So let me explain a little bit more on this, okay? So bringing together the whole optimization thing, the plans are generated when there isn't already a plan in the cache that can be used for you and for your session settings. They're never saved on disk, and, and I'm not talking about plan guides, but a procedure itself doesn't have a plan associated with it that gets saved to disk. In fact, they're very transient. They can be in the cache, but then they can either get pushed out of the cache or even fall out of the cache because they aren't used frequently. And there's a bunch of things that you can do to push them out of the cache. Of course, things like restarting your server or flushing your entire server's cache or flushing the entire database's cache. The DBCC flush proc in DB is kind of the old undocumented way to do this. In 2016, they added a new option called a scoped configuration, which unfortunately is terribly named in my opinion, it, but even flush proc in DB was terribly named because what these flush is the entire plan cache for that database. So it's not just procedures plans, but it's even your statement cache, your you know SP uh, execute SQL plans and so forth. So I don't really like the name of procedure cache here. I really wish it had been called plan cache, but the point, and I think I made a note, yeah, it's the entire database's plan cache, not just procedures. So you have to remember that and I just, I wish they had named that better. Um, SP recompile, you can do on a procedure. So that causes that procedures plan to essentially be, it actually doesn't get pushed out at that point. It gets what we call invalidated. Um, but the end result is the same. Since that plan has been invalidated, that plan won't be available to be reused. So on the next execution, a new plan would be generated. And plans can be aged out because they're not being used. Plans can be invalidated because a schema has been changed, like one of the tables that's referenced in the procedure has changed. So then that would invalidate the plans against that object. It could also be that statistics have changed, but whenever things get really funky across versions, I tend to put in some hidden slides that have more details about that. So when you guys get this slide deck, make sure that you look at the hidden slides as well, because there are some differences uh, with regard to statistics across different versions. I'm I'm going to use the word assuming here. I'm assuming that most of you guys are using 2012 or higher. <laughs> um, that's probably a bad assumption, as I know that many of you are still using 2008, 2008 R2, or dare I even mention 2005, 2000, or 70. Now, if you're using 6.0 or 6.5, you have other problems, and I can't help you today. Um, I could help you consulting-wise, but my goodness, that would be like... A major problem for me to remember 6.0 and 6.5, but I still have customers and I have people that come up to me and say they're still using 6.0 or 6.5, which is crazy to me. But statistics as of 2012, right, as of 2012, um, they work pretty well, meaning if the statistics of an object changes, it's very likely to cause plan invalidation and you'll get a new plan. But if you are in 2008 or 2008 R2, there's some weird influences of things like the database option, auto update um, statistics. So look at that hidden slide if you are still using uh, versions earlier than 2012. But the key point, okay, when a plan goes into cache, that plan gets put in the cache for reuse. And 
all session settings that match that plan's session settings will reuse that plan. And that can actually be both a positive and a negative. So let me explain that. Reusing plans can definitely be good, right? SQL Server is going to save time and compilation, and it's going to have the plan already there, so it can just run with that, which is great. The problem is that subsequent parameters passed into that procedure really might not benefit from the plan that's already there. And I'm going to explain this in more detail, but it only is valid if subsequent parameters don't require a plan change in order to execute optimally. And I'm going to show you a way to see this and to understand this. And that's what I think is the best thing I can show you today. Something that you can teach your developers or you can get your developers to come back and watch this session. And I've got some easy ways for them to tell, even with small amounts of data, and even crummy data, because as we all know, a lot of development environments don't have a complete and total copy of production on a production-sized server. I mean, I wish that they could. I wish that every development environment literally had a recent backup of production, had a copy of the production server's hardware, and did all of their testing on that, which, of course, you know, would be great because it would be much more realistic. But a lot of people don't. And unfortunately, when they don't have realistic data sizes or realistic data distribution or data quality, then you might think that their their optimization might not be as good. And that's often true. But I can still give you a way if they're looking for them to know that they have these potential problems. So this is really the, the point of this. Reusing plans might be and sometimes can be incredibly bad and, and it can, can be worse than recompiling. So I'm going to show you how to see this. I'm going to show you how to control this. I'm going to show you an easy option for fixing this temporarily. And I'll show you a better option as a long term change that I think is way more effective in terms of balancing the pros and cons of recompilation. So again, I'll tie it all together in a, in a second. So the example I'm going to use to prove my point is one that I see everywhere. I call them multi-purpose procedures. Some people call them the kitchen sink procedures. Um, I, I also sometimes call them OSFA procedure, like one size fits all procedures, where somebody has created, and in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I did a blog post on this, and I created a, a cute little, um, I'm bringing this up in another window, so give me a second, uh, trip high performance procedures, there it is. And I'll bring this over here in a second once I've got it. Okay, so I have a blog post called Building High Performance Procedures. And I have this cute little Widgets R Us uh, screenshot. And the idea, um, <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm laughing at the adverts about bathing suits there. Sorry. But anyway, so customer lookup, Widgets R Us. Um, you specify a customer number or a last name or a first name or and or a middle initial. Like these are what a lot of people call kitchen sink dialogues, right? You give the the employee or the customer or whatever a dialogue that allows them to put in like anything they want, right? And I, I made a little joke towards the bottom of this. Enter any combination of criteria for searching. Searches for a customer number, a full name without wildcards, or an email should be pre fast. Wild card matches may be slow and inefficient. Grab a cup of coffee. I mean, I was joking when I put that together, but sometimes I would say that you should give your users like two levels of dialogue. Like the things that you know that are fast and efficient, maybe have that as the opening screen. Like, do you know the customer number? Do you know the actual customer name? And then have a button at the bottom that says fuzzy matches, wildcard searches, slower searches, less optimal searches. Um, you know, try to teach your users the more efficient way to interact with the database, and they probably will interact with it more efficiently. Give them a kitchen sink dialogue like this one, and I promise you, they won't, they won't be trained to work with it more effectively. But 
let's say you do have this because it's so, so common, and they start to create a procedure, you know, that has all these different parameters, customer ID, last name, first name, middle initial, email, region, here, and I'll make this a little bit larger so you can see this, right? And then inside the procedure, you probably have code that looks like this, where customer ID equals the parameter of customer ID, or that parameter is null. And the last name is like the last name parameter, or the last name parameter is null. Now, some people have said, no, no, my code doesn't look like that. I use coalesce. Okay, fine. Whether you've done it with the where clause, like my first example, or the coalesce, or let's throw this one in here too, case expressions, when customer ID parameter is null, then customer ID, otherwise just the customer ID and so forth, right? I want to stress that it doesn't matter which of these things you're doing, they all stink, okay? They're all terrible. And let me go back to the slide. So I call this kind of code a multi-purpose procedure. Now, even if your code doesn't look like this, you can still do what I'm going to show you to see the behavior and see if the behavior matches the symptoms I'm going to show you. So let's let's start diving in and, and show you this demo because this, I think, is going to really help you. So now I, <laughs> I made some little hashtags here, multi-purpose procedures. The problem that happens in a lot of development environments is that they actually look okay in a development environment, but they end up not scaling in production because developers tend to only do what is often known as code coverage testing. So let me dive in and start showing you this. Okay, so I've got Management Studio up. And I think, there we go, I do have it on the screen. So what I'm going to give you guys is a solution. And that solution has one project called multi-purpose procs and then in that project there's multiple scripts now even if you can't for whatever weird reason open up this solution the ssms sln file you can certainly go into the subdirectory and open up the files and in fact let me just show you essentially what it's going to look like because i'm going to give kenny a zip and it's going to kind of look like this right there's that multi-purpose prox SSMS SLN, which is what I opened, but that points to this subdirectory, multi-purpose proc, and then you can see there are the scripts. So if for whatever reason you try to open up this solution and you can't, um, I mean, I don't know why you'd still be using the 2012 tools. You really should be using the 2017 standalone management studio, no matter what version you're connecting to. But if you are still using, for example, the 2012 tools, you won't be able to open this SSMS SLN. So you can certainly go to the scripts directly. So in here, and you want to essentially do them in order, I'm going to start by restoring credit. I've got a backup of credit. Um, a backup from 2008, so you guys can restore that to 2008, 2012, 2016, even 2017, and I, I have done this, and I'm actually using 2016 here today, and just to show you, I'm going to re-restore uh, credit, so I have a nice, clean version of credit. This is the only script that you guys are going to need to actually modify, and the reason you're going to modify it is I don't know where you're going to put the backup. I don't know what the name is of your server if you're using local instances or named instances. I don't know what your directory structure is and so forth. So this is a SQL CMD script that you'll need to modify. But of course, once you modify this and save this, then you can just re-restore credit whenever you need to and have a nice clean uh, version of credit that you can play with. So uh, if you run into any problems, you can certainly ping me, but all you'll have to do is go up here, query, SQL CMD mode. See, if I turn that off, notice the lines are not grayed. But if you go SQL CMD mode, the lines are grayed, so you know which lines to change. And I have some commented out lines that you know might be closer to your server's name or directory or whatever, but you'll change this and then run it, restore credit. Okay, so credit is now nice and clean. You guys saw me run that. Script one is my setup script. Now, script one has a few things in it. 
um, I say here, first, restore and set up credit. Second, this script, basically, we're going to tweak a few things for this demo. Whoops. So I'm going to use credit. Now, this first step you don't have to do. I say here, let's bring over a few more rows. You don't have to do this part, but a bit more data makes the demo more interesting. And you can use AdventureWorks 2012, AdventureWorks 2014. Some of the AdventureWorks databases have changed schema over time, but just changing this to 2012 and 2014 works. I can't remember if it does for 2016 as well, but you can get those databases from CodePlex. Now, again, you don't have to do this, but if you do, so I'll do this, I'll show you that I just brought over 19,000 more rows. And some people have asked me, why did I do this? And I did this because this is a lot of what your developers do. When they're trying to test code, they grab sample database from here, sample database from there, sample database, you know, they make it up, they do Cartesian products, they, they just grab data from everywhere. And while it might seem good to have more and more data, and, and I would argue that generally more data is better, sometimes more data that's bad data isn't really all that great. But I'm going to still show you that even with bad data, if they test things a little bit differently with the strategy I'm going to show you, they can still see, thank you, Paul just brought me another cup of throat coat, which is awesome. But, <laughs> but he walked out and says, but don't pretend that I like you. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I've just added this data. And again, you know, more data is generally better, but not necessarily if it's ugly data. And this is kind of ugly data, but the good news is if they test things like I'm going to show you, you will end up seeing that they can still tell, even with not very much data and generally kind of ugly data, that they have these problems. So that's the thing that I think is really cool. There's really no development environment that, you know, if they test better, right? should, you know, they should be aware of these problems much earlier than it being in production. So, but I will show you solutions for both in production and development. Now, the other thing that's super common is with code, like I started to show you, that kind of, you know, lots of different parameters. What a lot of people end up doing is creating indexes for the different columns that people are going to specify. So they end up, you know, having, um, well, first of all, let me add an email column. Okay, let me do that. So I'm adding an email column. I'm also adding a couple of rows, one for me and one for Paul. Um, I end up searching for these a little bit later. And then I'm going to give everybody an email just by almost, you know, stupidly grabbing their first name, middle initial, and last name and concatenating that together with a few other things. So it's kind of a, an ugly email. And then you can see some of my rows and uh, I've got 29,000 now, and then I'll do top 1,000 so you can see some of the data. And initially, right, it looks pretty good, you know, Melissa L. Alexander with an address and so forth. But then you see some data here, and this is kind of ugly. Um, it turns out that this data was actually the data grabbed from AdventureWorks, and this is kind of some of the default data that's in credit. But no matter what, if you look across this entire table, it's got some weird patterns to it. So that's kind of interesting in and of itself. So the point that I was making is that names are everything from goofy to realistic. Some fields haven't been populated, some fields have. You know, I would even argue the biggest problem, like I put in here, is that the data set is kind of small. There's only 30,000 rows. And if in production, we're expecting to have, I mean, we're hoping to have millions of customers, that's going to really impact the efficiency of these searches. And what might be seemingly fast on my development machine might not scale at all once we get to production quality and, and uh, volumes of data. So now, this was where I was getting to with my, my kind of catch-all procedure. If we're going to search sometimes for first names, often developers will say, well, we probably need an index on first name. And since we're going to search on last name, let's put an index on last name. And if we're going to search on email, let's put an index on email. And they kind of very commonly have this, you know, where clause index, where clause index, where clause index strategy. And 
while there can be uses for some of these indexes, you will end up finding that having a whole bunch of really narrow indexes doesn't really satisfy a lot of the different searches and criteria that you're doing. And a, a better way is to have what we would call wider indexes and indexes that use the feature like include. And I heard Kenny say that Kendra is coming back to talk to you guys about indexes and include, which is awesome. Um, you guys definitely want to learn more about that. So Kendra's presentation will be great for that. I've got a, a plural site course if you're interested interested on generally using indexes. So there's resources out there that will help you. And it's really important to start learning some of those tricks and um, you know benefits and the power of better indexes than this. But this is super common, so I'm going with it. And now let's get to the OSFA procedure. So this is now script 02, multi-purpose procedures or OSFA procedures, whatever you want to call it. And I've got a bunch of comments in here, but I'm just going to get to the code. So, you know, we're going to create this oh so clever OSFA procedure. And I'm going to call it get member information. And I've got, you know, all those parameters that I was mentioning, member number, it's member number in this case, rather than customer number or whatever. Let me take a few more sips of my, uh, my throat coat tea here. This stuff is, um, you know, not the, I mean, I, I hate to diss it because it's so awesome. It's not the best tasting. I don't think it actually tastes terrible, but it's not like I'm going to sip it most days. <laughs> but it works. Oh, my goodness, does it work. Uh, so anyway, um, and you know what? Give me a second. I got to blow my nose, too. <sighs> Sorry. All right, let me bring that mic back. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, the joys of airline travel during cold season. <laughs> um, okay, so did I drop it? Let me just make sure I've dropped it if I haven't, and I'm going to create it. So there's all my parameters, and there's kind of the, the default code that I was showing you guys, where the member number is the member number parameter, or the member number is null, and so forth. So I create this, right? And then, you know, the developer says, okay, let me try this with a name like trip. And they execute it and they see the name come back really quickly. I, I'm not going to show you the plan yet because I'm, I'm assuming that most of your developers aren't like immediately looking at the plan or IOs or anything like that. So let's not look at the plan yet. I'm going to run it with percent27.com and Look at that, it comes back pretty quickly, even though there are you know a thousand rows that came back this time. And I run it with 99.12 and it comes back. And the point that I'm making, your developers should do better testing than this, don't get me wrong. I mean, code coverage testing means that they are thoroughly testing all of the branches and what's going on with that code. So, you know, due diligence would say that they'd be doing much more testing than this, but, they still are probably only looking at the time that it's taking and the results. You know, am I getting good data? Is it running quickly? You know, does it run quickly enough? Okay, ship it, right? I mean, you could argue that code coverage Ah, code coverage testing is really the primary key to testing your code, you know, making sure that it runs and executes. The problem, though, is the whole does it run quickly is because today's hardware for your developers, you know, it's amazing how much crappy code they can write and get a, get away with without performance problems on their hardware. Like, I'm running a really fast machine here. I could run a tremendous amount of crappy code and barely, you know, blink an eye in terms of the performance of a table that only has 30,000 rows. So the problem is now that they don't have good data quality or good data volumes. But even if they were testing on a development server that was the same of production, they don't even necessarily have development workloads running. So it's kind of hard even then to do really accurate testing. But here's my point. If they only do code coverage testing, that is the problem for understanding 
what's going to go wrong with these OSFA procedures. So I want to describe something I call plan stability testing. And to do this, it does require turning show plan on. But before you start going, oh, my developers are never going to understand the plans or, or even want to look at these plans, and it's just going to create a mess. They do not need to know all of the ins and outs of the plans to actually do plan stability testing. What they're actually going to look for is really just pattern matching. And, and the good news is you don't have to be a SQL Server expert to see this problem. And that's what I think is really important. You can, with very little really deep knowledge of SQL Server, still tell that you have this problem by turning on IOs and show plan. So I've turned on graphical plan up here with this little icon, and I'm going to turn statistics IO on. You don't even need time or anything right now. And I'll try those same three executions again. So I run them again. And again, you know, they come back sub second. I get my data back really quickly. So let's start by looking at the plans. Now the plan is kind of misleading. And, and I'll show you where the plan information starts getting really interesting. The first thing that you should all be able to see that I think is fairly obvious on the screen is that I've got three plans that largely look totally identical in every way, shape, or form. In fact, if you look at the relative to the batch cost that's shown up here, relative to the batch 33, relative to the batch 33, relative to the batch 33, you're seeing three plans that SQL Server says have exactly the same cost and their cost relative to this batch was equal, right? 33, 33, 33. So go to the messages window where I turned on IOs and just look at this for a second. The first one did 78 logical reads. The second one did 90,000 logical reads and the third one did 78. And I guess my point is, does that look even? Does that look exactly the same? I mean, first of all, it doesn't look exactly the same. Going back to the plans, there is, oh my God, it's terrible. I'm almost embarrassed to tell you this, but there is one little tiny difference between these plans, and it's the thickness of the lines. I, I know, I told you I was embarrassed to tell you that, but the thickness of these lines in the middle is thicker than those lines. And of course, I, I, the sarcasm, hopefully you're getting, that is not something that's really obvious. And in fact, what you're seeing here, these plans, the coolest thing about getting the actual plans is that you can dive deeper. The highlights that you're seeing here are really coming from what we call the estimated plan. And unfortunately, since this plan is getting reused, there's only one plan that's associated with this procedure. So the plan is the same every time. But if you hover over some of the different icons, the, the lines in this tooltip that have the words actual with them can start to show you where there's problems. So if you look about three quarters of the way down, and, and I I can't really do that with the icon, otherwise it moves. But if you look about three quarters of the way down, it says estimated number of rows, 1.98. And then you go up to the top, essentially, it says number of rows read, and then actual number of rows. So the number of rows read, 29,000. Actual number of rows, one. So the estimated number of rows, 1.98, and the actual number of rows, one, seems pretty good. Okay, that seems accurate. But if I go to this one, you can see estimated number of rows, 1.98, actual number of rows, 29,000. So this one seems off. Now, a lot of people would immediately say, oh, I bet it's statistics. And this is actually one of the primary reasons that statistics gets blamed incorrectly. This problem is a parameter sensitivity problem, not a statistics problem. See, this second execution is getting its plan from cache, and that plan has different parameters associated with it. Something that you can see that might show this to you is the properties window. I don't know if some of you guys use this. I'm going to pin it, okay? And I'm going to go over here to this select, 
and I'm going to go to the parameter list here. Now, look at all those parameters I have, parameter one, parameter two, parameter three. Now, you could expand them all individually, like go to five and see that the parameter compiled value is null and the runtime value is null. So that one doesn't seem to be that impacting. But if you go up here to parameter list and you hit shift eight, which is asterisk, it expands them all, which I think is very useful, especially if you have like 35 parameters. And then you can quickly look at the compiled and runtime values and start to find like parameter three, the compiled value was null, but the runtime value is percent 27. And if you go a little bit further for last name, the compiled value is trip, but the runtime value is null. And what this is telling me is that this plan was not created for my parameters. So this plan is probably not good for me. Now, even if you think that this is too complicated, remember, the only thing you really have to have seen are these numbers. Like the IOs are not equivalent. That's a very quick and easy way to tell that even though the execution plans seemed to give the same estimations in their costs, the actuality of it was different. And you could start to look at time, but on something so fast like this, time probably isn't that helpful. But as you start to get to bigger data sets, time actually might be very helpful for some of you guys. So going back to this, I'm starting to say, okay, that's not a really great plan for any of them. But here's the coolest, so easy way for your developers to test this. I love this little trick. You can execute the procedure percent27.com, for example, and then execute it again with recompile. Now, line one, oh, excuse me, I'm going to have to blow my nose here. I'm going to mute myself for a second. So give me like just two seconds to blow my nose here. Oh my goodness, my ears just cleared. <laughs> oh, oh. <coughs> okay, wait, what were some? And I'm so excited that this is recorded. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, so, okay, line 145 get member information, email address percent27.com with recompile. The coolest thing about line 145 is that that execution will get a plan just for that execution and it won't impact the plan in cache, it won't touch the plan in cache, it won't use the plan in cache. It's really a great way of kind of side by side testing something to see if the plan that we're getting from cache, line 142, is the same as what happens when we get a plan just for that execution. So if I run these two side by side with show plan on, what I should be able to look at is just even the shape of the plans. And are the shapes the same? I mean, you can get your five-year-old to help you out with this one. Honey, do the patterns match? Why no? Well, there you go. It's a parameter sensitivity problem. And I know I'm making light of it, but my point is that you don't need to be an expert in plans to see really quickly, really easily that these don't match. And when I requested a plan just for my execution, I got a different plan than the plan that's in cache. So what that tells me is that the optimal plan for this procedure needs to vary for the different parameters being supplied. So I'm going to come back over here and show you also that the IOs are better and of course, depending on how much data there really is, the times might be radically better. On my machine, not so much because even 90,000 IOs is sub-second. So you, you won't see time differences in a lot of cases, but there's some obvious differences here. So what about the 9912 scenario? Now this one is a little bit tougher. I look at the execution plans and initially their shape looks the same. But does anybody notice a couple of things? And I know I'm I'm asking this as a rhetorical question, but the relative cost to the batch says 57 and 43. And then if you actually look at the names of the indexes, like here, member last name, this one actually has a different index in it. Now, to be honest, 
neither of these plans are really great for this one. And in fact, without going into too much detail, even with recompile, doesn't really do as good of a recompile as you can get SQL Server to do. But without all of those tangents, and, and Paul White has a fantastic blog post on this, and I do have a link in the resources I'm going to give to Kenny. So you can read more about um, the parameterization, execution, evaluations, and all of the things that SQL Server can and can't do with recompile and so forth. But the point is you still should be able to tell very quickly that there are differences when you ask for the procedure to get its own plan, right? So I want you to look at time, but remember that time is kind of maybe iffy if there's not that much data. IOs is going to be a lot more obvious. And then that compiled versus runtime will also remind you that even though the estimated and actual in terms of rows are off, that it's not statistics. It's that the plan was compiled with different values than you're running with. So you probably need to do something, okay? So now I've set up the problem, now I'm gonna solve it for you, okay? So I have some key points to this. Now I did, let me go back to the slides. Um, sorry, let me flip back to the slides here. Okay, I have some key point slides that, that re-summarizes the demo. So when you go back through the demo, you'll wanna remember this. And you know, this is stuff I've said, what runs in development might not scale. But just to keep us on track, read the demo key points when you're going back through the demo. Now, here's what I think is really cool. Now, this slide is not gonna make no sense until I go back to the demo again. So I have another script here, and I called it multi-purpose procedure executions with different parameters. Now, this is more of what I'm hoping your developers are doing. Like, when I create a stored procedure, I'll usually have like a test script for that stored procedure. And, and I usually go a lot further than this, but let's just take the very simple side of things. Like, what if I have a little test script? Um, forget the first part of it. Let's go right here to 32. So I use credit. And then in my test script, I have test scenarios, right? I have get member information, 9912, get member information, last name, first name. So this is like my code coverage testing, right? So I've got all these different scenarios. And like I, I have 14 different scenarios in here. And I run this and I, I make sure that everything comes back quickly. I mean, I just ran 14 different scenarios and it took one second. You know, this would be what your code coverage folks might be saying is, you know, adequate and acceptable. But here's the cool thing. The reason that this code coverage script is so cool is really the stuff I have at the top. Look what I have here. I have a hidden SP recompile. So remember I mentioned this on the plan and validation side. This is a way that you can basically kick a plan out of cache. What you're really doing is invalidating the plan. So I'm gonna invalidate the current plan that's in cache. Okay, and then I'm gonna pick a scenario and I'm gonna pick one that I know is pretty bad. So I'm gonna pick test scenario four and I'm gonna execute it. Now remember, if there isn't a plan in cache, when you execute, you'll get a plan for that set of parameters. So now this set of parameters has dictated what the plan for this procedure should be. So then I'm gonna go back to the top Notice that the SP recompile is commented out, and I'm gonna run this whole script. What I'm gonna, oh, excuse me, I gotta stop for just one more second again. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is go back to the top and notice I, the use credit's kind of redundant because I had the SP recompile there. I don't really need to do it twice, but I was just showing that this part, 32 on, is probably what your tester scripts look like. I'm gonna have you add this so that you can end up changing the plan and then running the whole script. So what is the script doing? I'm gonna grab the, the starting time, turn IOs and time on, and then I'm gonna run through all the scenarios, of course, testing what the impact is of the scenarios plan that's in cache. So I run this with scenario four, and you know this time it took two seconds, which again, most people would be like, Kimberly, you're really seeming to make a big deal out of two seconds, who cares? That's not the point. The reason it's taking two seconds is that my hardware is killing the problem. 
and the fact that it's only me on the hardware and the fact that I've only got 30,000 rows. All of these things are really kind of masking how bad this problem is. But if you go to the messages window, now you go to the messages window I, and I, I push the what got executed to the window. So we have to kind of go to the end of that. And here we go. The first execution did 114 IOs. It had a work file, a work table. I'll explain a little bit more on that in a second. The second one did 91,000 IOs, had a work file and a work table. The next one did 91,000. The next one did 500. The next one did 114. So if you go back to the slide, this is going to explain what my slide is. My slide is essentially Excel output from me tracking what the different test scenarios do to the different tests when you execute. Meaning, when I put test four scenarios plan into cache, then the different tests have these IOs. And you just saw that, like 114, 91,981. You know, my IOs might be a little bit off because I think I've tweaked the data since this particular scenario, but it's pretty close, right? Now, test four, I know, has another problem. It creates what's called a work file and a work table, which are hash objects that need to go to tempdb. And even worse, for some of these scenarios, since the estimate was so much lower, they're actually spilling, which is another even further problem. Now, again, you might not know that. Like, I would not even get that wrapped up with tracking everything here. Um, you know, you don't even need, oh, it's not letting me draw on this screen. Um, you don't even need this column like spilled. You could just track IOs because IOs alone already show you a wild pattern here, right? I mean, IOs alone show you that with test one or test five or test 10, that you get these wildly varying IOs. And then if you switch, kick out the plan and run test two, you get wildly varying IOs, but different wildly varying IOs. So my point is if somebody actually looks, you can see that you have plan instability for this procedure. So the question is, how the heck do you fix this, right? You know, and, and I know you guys have a lot of this on your servers. Everyone does. I would recommend really playing around with that multi-purpose procedure script and seeing that you get something like this. And this is something you'll be able to do in your environment. So now, you know, what do you do? What's your solution? And luckily, I only have about probably five to 10 minutes to wrap everything up. So I'll be right around an hour, but I, I will go a little bit over 1 p.m. Um, oh, 1 p.m. my time, sorry. Or, geez, it's not noon, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Whatever time it is, I'm getting very close to the hour. <laughs> so what do we do? How do we solve this problem, right? You could execute things with recompile, but I'm going to strongly, strongly, strongly urge you to only use that in testing. And I do have some, I think, hidden slides that explain. Yes, I'm looking at the hidden slides. There are some hidden slides that explain more on why execute with recompile is terrible in production, but it's okay for limited uses of testing. You could use SP recompile like I did to kick the plan out of cache, and some people do that. But the problem is that that just temporarily, you know, solves your problem. You could still end up having the problem come back because that plan might fall out of cache, and again, you might get a bad plan in cache again. Some people update statistics and unfortunately see some positives from doing this because often updating statistics invalidates the plan and then you get a new plan, which is better. And then you think, hey, the statistics update solved my problem. So you're kind of getting what's, what's a false positive. So that's a really common, very bad solution because it's very expensive to not just invalidate the plan, but also having had to update the statistics. So while while some of you might be doing this, I would strongly recommend SP recompile over updating statistics for sure. It's way cheaper and it's going to have the same side effect essentially. Now, here's what some of you may have learned to do over the last you know, year or so, and that's adding option recompile to the code, which is phenomenal. Don't get me wrong. Some of you have probably already learned to do this. You've probably done this and you've probably been amazed and you've probably been wondering why you just sat through an hour of me telling you to do this because you already know to do this. And my answer to this is I look at option recompile as a phenomenal solution for some scenarios. 
but some scenarios, it's a really bad long-term solution. So I really think of it as more of a temporary solution. And let me explain this, okay? So let me go back to my scenario and show you that it is pretty darn amazing to use this. So this is script three, multi-purpose procedures solution one, which of course, if you go right up to the top, I'll turn statistics IO on, time is not that exciting, again, because of my machine, and I'll just tack on option recompile line 58 into my code, that's all I have to do. I mean, you have to love the simplicity of this. And then I'm gonna run it for last name, I'm gonna run it for percent %27, I'm gonna run it for 99.12. And if you remember, some of the most optimal numbers we saw, like let me go back to the slide for a second. Remember this, right? Some of the most optimal numbers, like look at the green, uh, and that might be hard for some of you guys to see, but like for test one, um, line one would be 50. Test two, the most optimal would be test two, 78. Test three, the most optimal would be line three, 293. So 50, 78, 293, 507, 359, 271, 926. Like all of those numbers, you know, are pretty good. But let's go back to my execution with recompile and look at the IOs. Five. Okay, 900 is similar to some of the numbers. And three. I mean, you have never seen fives or threes, you know. So you are really getting a much, much, much more optimal plan. So yes, option recompile looks phenomenal, but here's my problem with it, right? You're paying the cost of recompilation every single time you execute. And I would argue, like, let me give you a scenario. Like imagine you just have member number, last name and first name as parameters. So they could supply member number alone, last name alone, first name alone. They could supply member number and first name. They could supply member number and last name. They could supply first name and last name, or they could supply member number, first name, and last name, right? I mean, this is why I only did three, right? There's seven possible combinations. But the point I wanna make is if they supply member number alone, you don't ever really need to recompile because member number is the clustered key. Member number is always going to return only one row. This is always going to have a stable, um, you know, efficient clustered index seek plan. You'll never need to recompile. And I could argue that no matter what first name you supply, even if there's wild cards, that will still, I mean, who cares if they say where first name has an E in it, you know, like percent E percent and member number equals one, two, three, four, five. See, if you send that to SQL Server, SQL Server is gonna say, well, I'm not gonna look up all the first names that have an E in it. I'm gonna look up member number one, two, three, four, five and see if there's an E in their first name. So anytime you supply a member number, you really have a stable plan that does not need to be recompiled. And if you remember how I started this whole lecture, if you, train the users like with a dialogue that says enter the member number or enter an actual last name and first name you might end up finding that the majority of executions are these more stable executions like maybe 60 percent of the time they are supplying this stable efficient uh, execution. That means 60% of the time you should be reusing a nice, stable, simple plan that's cached. And by recompiling every time, you're wasting CPU. Now, for a stored procedure so small like this that is not that expensive, you could argue it's not that big of a deal. But if you start putting option recompile everywhere, which I have seen becoming more and more of a problem, you will end up eating up all that CPU headroom that you currently have. So you really need to be more strategic. So my point, let me go back to the slides for a second. My point is that this with recompile stuff that I just showed you really does work great in development and it really does scale in production but only to a point. You can't go crazy with it because you'll end up having problems eventually. But if I go back to that script that had all 14 of the different test scenarios, you'll see that the numbers look great across pretty much all of the scenarios. So yes, I know this looks amazing. Yes, I know it's easy. I know a lot of people wanna you know, kind of hang up on my webcast right now and go change all their code or connect to production and change your code. And, and yes, this might actually be a good thing for you to do for a couple of your procedures. 
I still would say it's more of a temporary or band-aid fix for some of those procedures. I want you to do this, okay? Now, this better um, solution is more complicated, and it will take a little bit of time for your developers to grasp onto this, and it is ugly, okay? So I wanna preface this by saying, the adoption rate here, it's going to take a little bit of a push to get them to do this. But I swear, if they do this for one or two procedures, you'll be amazed at how much better overall it will help your server scale. So here is my final demo and my final solution. It's here, multi-purpose procedures solution two. And I'm going to go through it quickly because you're going to have a hard time kind of memorizing this whole thing anyway, but I want to give you the gist of it. And you're going to have to take some time. I've got lots of comments in here. Now, what I'm going to actually do is strategically build a statement that I will execute with only the non-null parameters. So I'm building a string called SP execute SQL string that has my select from member where member number, blah, blah, blah. But I'm creating a dummy where clause initially so that all I have to do is tack on the non-null uh, parameter clauses. So if member number is not null, then I will add to the string and member number equals the member number. And if last name is not null and so forth. So I have my strings right up to there. Now the coolest thing that I'm doing, this is the real trick, is this. I have a recompilation flag and initially I say, yes, I want to recompile. But if they specify that the member number is set, right, it's not null, then I'm going to turn off recompilation so the plan is going to be saved so that I will be able to reuse it. And then you could have other criteria. The more and more you learn the different data values and the different parameters, you could start putting more scenarios into your code that don't warrant recompilation. Simply put, I'm basically saying, if they're supplying at least three characters of the last name and three characters of the first name before they supply a wild card, then that's selective enough. In other words, if they say something like T-R-I and K-I-M percent, then I think that that is selective enough to use a strategy that will use an index and so forth. So I've got you know other scenarios here. And then notice, if recompilation is on, I am going to tack on option recompile. Now, just so you can see what's happening, I'm going to output the strings because you're going to see that we are going to generate multiple strings. And then I'll show you how you execute it right here using SP Execute SQL. Now, some of you might not know a lot about SP Execute SQL. It's a very cool way of forcing a statement to go into the cache. But see, what I'm doing is where it shouldn't be cached, I'm passing in an option recompile. So this is my clever trick. When something is an SP execute SQL, it's not associated with the stored procedure so much as it's executed with the statement. So I'll have a bunch of these statements in the cache. Some will be reused, some won't. So I'll say execute, so that creates my procedure. And then I'll show you just, well, I've got IOs on, so let me just turn that on so it's on. And then let me just show you the first one so I can show you kind of what's happening. Select star from member where one is one, that's the dummy where clause, and member number equals. Well, like I told you, when member number is passed, that plan is nice and stable and consistent. I don't need to recompile. So there will be a plan in the cache for that statement, and only when the statement looks exactly like that, and of course, when the session settings match and the resource governor group match and all that other stuff, then we will reuse that plan. And if we look at another one, like this has at least three characters, right? Like this is a good one, right? I'll execute this fourth one and you'll see that, uh, you know, it's not going to have a nice stable plan. So at the end of this, I've tacked on, uh, let me just scroll and show you that, I've tacked on option recompile. So that statement will go into the cache, yes, but because of the option recompile being passed in, it won't get reused. So I have the scenarios that will get reused and the scenarios that won't. And now when I execute this across a whole bunch of different scenarios, sometimes I'm recompiling, sometimes I'm not, but the point is my IOs 
are the more efficient IOs. And if I were actually watching over and across many executions on a busy server, the total cost and impact to CPU would be far lower, especially um, given the different percentages of the execution patterns. So, okay, let me stress, it is ugly, okay? I, I'm with you, it's ugly, it's, you know, something that's gonna take some time for your developers to get used to, it's gonna take more coding, but I wanna stress, it's not hard, okay? It, in some cases where there's complicated joins and so forth, it, it can be more complex, and sometimes people will create separate procedures for this, that can work really well, but the key point, especially when execution patterns exist that certain plans should be cached. The cool thing is you can have those plans go into cache, save time, save CPU, but still have the unstable plans getting recompiled. So this is one of the best things. And this concept I think is really important. And this is my trick to basically getting better performance across your server. But as it says at the top of the slide, you know, the Band-Aid fix, the temporary fix, the fix that might make your server magically fast. I mean, it might be a fantastic interim fix for some of you guys is option recompile. So definitely throw that into your arsenal if you're a DBA. If you start to see these patterns, option recompile could really, you know, save your tush. Um, so uh, I'll leave it at that, but this is one of my favorite strategies. I haven't seen any questions come up um, in the chat window, unless I'm not looking at the right chat window, I think I am. But if there's any questions, I'll stick around for questions. But when you guys get this um, slide deck, make sure you look at the hidden slides and make sure you look at these resource slides at the end. There's a bunch of blog posts that I think will really help you out or blog posts that you could pass on to your developers that they can read and even then go into some of the webcasts. Some are free, some are on plural sites, so they can get a code from Paul too. But the first one that I did a while back was in our new blog post series called SQL Skills SQL 101. And the very first one that I kicked it off was, was called Stored Procedures. So that's a really good one that kind of gives you an overview into recompilation. And then I link to a bunch of resources from there. And I actually link to the past session that's really detailed this blog post, building high performance procedures that was the one that had the widgets um, you know uh, dialogue that I explained to you guys and I did do a past summit presentation in 2014 on this so you can watch that and because it's on past TV even if you don't have the DVDs you can see this and it's free um, and then of course the plural site courses if you don't know anything about statement execution, um, like ad hoc statements versus like SP execute SQL, which I showed you guys, that optimizing ad hoc statement and performance course would be really good for you because I explain what happens with statement level caching and how that works and even what's called plan cache bloat and some of the things that you can do to make your server more efficient. And then you can watch the stored procedures course, which goes into more detail into other things you can do, not just option recompile, because I kind of glossed over um, some of the other things. Like, I, well, I didn't even mention them. They are in my hidden slides though, something called optimize for and optimize for unknown. So I've got a lot more detail in that plural site course. And then, as I mentioned at the very beginning, some of the complexities around troubleshooting that occur because of different session settings or different resource governor groups are in that course. It's basically the part two course to optimizing store procedure performance. The bad news is there's 18 hours of content on this slide. I mean, I don't know, you can look at that as bad news and good news, but it is gonna take a little bit of time to get through all of this. But I really did a lot of demos and a lot of very important and interesting tangents. So I think you guys will really appreciate that if you wanna get really good in depth on that. And then, I do have some other blog posts and white papers and resources um, at the very end that might be interesting for some of you guys. And that's all, okay? Oh, no, I forgot I had plan cash. <laughs> I have some plan cash blog posts as well. And that article that Bob wrote is kind of dated now, but it's kind of a, a cool article for some of you using, you know, ORMs and link to SQL and so forth. So 
that's all. Um, so, Ketty, I'll stick around. Um, oh, okay. Where is the Q and A? Um, oh, questions. There they are. All right. So let me pop open this window. I was looking at the chat window, not the questions window. That was my problem, Kenny. I can see it. Um, so, 2008 R2 will option recompile help at the statement level within very large 1,000 line procedures. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if you want to give me any more details on it, but yes, option recompile is incredibly powerful. It was added in 2005, so yes, you can use it in 2005 and larger. And let me see if there's anything else here. Um, oh, wait, I've missed a few here. Okay. Um, yeah, so go back to the slides uh, for the code. I'm just going to make sure I get everything. So yes, you'll be getting the slides. And yes, you can get a plural site training code from Paul. His email is on slide five. So if you just look through the slides, when you get the slides, you'll be able to do that. Um, will update statistics invalidate the plan? <laughs> that is a really tough question to give you an exact answer to, but the hidden slide, slide 10, will tell you the scenarios, and I'm going to largely say yes, but there are some exceptions. The exceptions are only in versions prior to 2012 and only when the auto-update stats database level option has been turned off. So if you don't have that database option off or you're using 2012 and higher, then I can say with certainty that updating statistics will invalidate the plan as long as data has changed since you last updated the stats. Okay, so there's only one exception. If no rows have changed and you update the stats, SQL Server does not do plan and validation in 2012 and higher. And again, look at slide 10, because I have all of that on slide 10. And yes, all the scripts will be available. Um, okay, a, bit, a little bit of lag. Okay, if you have two users using the same procedure running at the same time, will they impact each other's plan if you use recompile? Um, no, actually. All plans are re-entrant, meaning that they can step into that plan and share that plan. So having two users at the same time is not an issue. Now, the recompilation since it has to do that step, it's not that it impacts each other, but you'll have more recompilations occurring, and that could have a little bit of an impact. But but no, it's not like they block, and I, I, I'm kind of assuming that that's what you meant. Um, I read about the drawbacks of using with recompile. According to what I know, there will be increased utilization. Ah, yes, the, the big difference, and, and this is on my hidden slides. Is it on my hidden slides? Um, it's actually more detailed in my plural site courses, but it's a, a great uh, question here. But yes, my biggest problem with using either execute with recompile or create with recompile is that the information about the plan is not tracked in the DM exec procedure stats DMV or the DM exec query stats DMV. So Carlos, you're, you're correct. That is really ugly and it makes troubleshooting more challenging. So from a production perspective, I would not recommend using execute with recompile in production, except for testing, because you know that you're doing it. But if you start putting it into code or somebody puts it into code, it becomes harder for administrators to actually track it. Um, yeah, you're welcome, Don. I, I, I knew that the adrenaline would kick in doing this with a cold, but I'm sorry that you guys had to suffer through my, my sneezes and coughing. But um, <laughs> uh, if you use force execution, oh, this is a great question. Um, if you use the force plan option instead of what I was doing, would that work? And the answer is kind of it depends. Um, it turns out that some of the forcing methods don't work with some optimization options. So that's a little bit hard to explain, but I, I tend to stay away from some of the uh, more in-depth forcing or more specific, let me rephrase that, some of the more specific forcing methods, unless I'm absolutely absolutely sure I've tried everything else. So in other words, I like things like option recompile or, or you know, 
another good one is it's hard to explain because I didn't talk about these, but something called uh, plan guide templates, for example, I really like because they're kind of generic ways of forcing rather than super specific ways of forcing. So Julie, I can take a little bit more offline if you want to send me an email, but I, I tend to try to stay away from that. And I'd like to get more details on exactly what you mean by forcing execution plan. Like, do you mean force seek or force plan or force order? Um, but but long story short is I, I try to avoid those at all costs and I only use them when I really get to a point where there's just no other option that's working. Uh, a couple of you have also said thank you, so you're welcome. Um, okay, and I mentioned Ray's uh, question, will optional recompile help at the statement level for even large procedures? Absolutely. Um, I would argue, Ray, that maybe breaking that procedure down into smaller, more modular procedures might also help. You know, large monolithic procedures tend to optimize the least efficiently, as odd as that sounds, but it's very true. So, you know, when you do start having larger procedures, sometimes I look to see if I can break them down. And part of the reason why that's interesting is that if you break down a stored procedure into smaller chunks, SQL won't step into or optimize a sub procedure unless it's actually executed. But with a large monolithic stored procedure, SQL Server tries to optimize code even if it doesn't get executed on that first execution which is hard to explain but i do have that in my stored procedures course on plural site so check that out um because that'll give you a lot more insight into modularizing your code because i do have that as another solution in my stored procedure course um should we put option recompile even with sql parameterization on on a store ah, ah, ah. Uh, Bruno, I think you mean forced parameterization as a database option. And will option recompile help? Absolutely. Absolutely. So if there's more to that question, uh, let me know. But but yes, if you've got forced parameterization on in a database, then option recompile becomes an even bigger, more important friend because forced parameterization will force even more statements to be what we call cached and reused. And it could lead to more parameter sensitivity problems. But if you put option recompile on the statements that shouldn't be cached, you can get around it. I have a big section in my uh, statement execution course on Pluralsight where I talk about not using forced parameterization and what to analyze before using forced parameterization um, because you really want to test something before you turn it on. It's hard to tell you're having big problems once you've already turned it on. So that, oh, I hope that helps, Bruno. Um, but check out the Plural Site course, and uh, specifically, that's the one called um, optimizing ad hoc statement performance. And let me know if if that doesn't help you. But um, do you have an opinion about adding a column store clustered index on a table that doesn't have indexes versus adding a regular regular index with the include to try to help performance as well. Um, well, this is a huge question, Brenda. I am, I am a fan of column store indexes, okay? A huge fan, when they first came out, of non-clustered column store indexes. And I think that there's a much wider set of uses for non-clustered column store indexes um, if you have a wide variety of different types of queries. So if you have a lot of large scale aggregates and you have a lot of point queries, then I'm probably gonna lean more towards a row store index with a column store index and possibly other non-clustered row store indexes. Um, but if you're doing mostly aggregations, mostly data warehousing, mostly large scale joins and so forth, that's where I lean more towards clustered column store. But even then, I, I'm not a big fan of clustered column store until 2016 because you still have the ability to add non-clusters. But that's, it, Brenda, that's a loaded, very difficult question. I have a course on Pluralsight on indexing where I do explain a little bit more of that. Um, and then I have to admit, outside of that, I don't have a lot of other 
resources for that except I guess my my online course that I do on VLTs because I do talk about very large tables and indexing but even then it's more about partitioning and architectures rather than indexing so that's a tough one um, but hopefully that helped a bit um, okay uh, just store procedure I'm looking I'm just making sure I didn't miss okay Brenda I have to go thanks um, Okay, with respect to your last solution, would it create that many queries in the plan cache as number of different permutations that can happen? Yes, um, Meyer uh, Barari, you, you mentioned, with respect to my final solution, are each of those queries essentially getting an entry in the cache? Yes. So you're actually putting, like if there's only three parameters, let me do that because the numbers are easier, but if there's only three parameters, then you will have once they all execute, like if you remember this scenario, I, with three parameters, I'd actually have seven different statements in the cache, and for statements one, five, and nine, well, and six, they would have the plan in cache as well, and then they would reuse it. But for two, three, and seven, they'd have option recompile added to it. So yes, there would be separate copies in the cache, but you'd never be reusing the ones for lines two, three, and seven. So that's the really cool trick. And ooh, okay, I think I might be getting close to done. A um, Couple of you said feel better, thanks. Thanks, Brent. <laughs> I am feeling a little bit better, but my goodness, the cold makes me sound terrible. Um, and oh, cool, Julie um, Ray, I wish. I think, am I done? I think I've got them. Um, we use 2016. Oh, Brenda, great, great. Um, thank you. I know it's a loaded question. Take more classes. Awesome. Um, I think that's it. I think I've gone through all of the answers there. So hopefully, Kenny, you've got all this in the recording. So for folks that had to leave, hopefully they'll listen to the recording. Um, literally, when I hang up, I'm going to bundle everything up and I'll send it to you in an email. So once you get that recording processed, I know it takes you guys a little bit of time to to, to make it all nice um, and, and get it up on the site. So, you know, thank you for having me. And um, I guess that's it. I'll shut up now. <laughs> thank you, Kimberly. This was wonderful. Um, yeah, I'll get everything uploaded as quickly as I can. Uh, thank you again for powering through the cold. Thank you to Throat Coat for uh, helping yeah. us all get thanks, through this. Thanks, Throat Coat. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks everybody. We'll uh, we'll see you next week. We're doubling up this month, so uh, we'll have another session next month or next week. Right on. Thanks everybody. Well, have fun next week, everybody. Have a good day.